morning, and thank you very much for attending. Uh, I'm Johan, I'm senior producer at SNG Studio. So I came here two years ago, local studio based in Sydney, but we also have offices in Melbourne and LA. And among many other games, we are the developers of Risk Global Domination, which is a uh, risk on mobile phones, on tablets, on tvOS, on Amazon devices like Kennel. Uh, on the far left, we have Sandro. It's our senior developer who has been on Risk, I think, even longer than me, right? And Aiken, who is currently our core feature developer and also designs the new risk maps. That's a job I envy him for. Yep. So if we look at risk, uh, it's the official and the only official Hasbro licensed risk game on mobile devices. So there are lots of ripoffs. We are aware of them. There are some really creative and really good remakes with an own spin that we sometimes look into for inspiration. Um, and it's been developed and published by SMG since uh, like the first SMG released version was end of 2016. So we are going now into the third year. We are mid of the third year and we are still growing, which is very exciting. Um, I have been told, not sure, about the numbers, but I have been told we are the biggest core strategy game on mobiles uh, developed in Unity, which is pretty amazing. I didn't know that. Currently, we have, that's a little bit outdated because we have worked on the presentation so long. Uh, currently, we are at around 2.5 million active players. And we have a leaderboard of around 7 to 8 million players who have played in the last year and are still ranked in the global leaderboard. Um, the business model is simple. Risk is free. You can download, you can play, you have no restrictions whatsoever when it comes to uh, game modes or participation in online games, but you are limited to a few games per day. This is done with a token system. If you want to play more games, you have to buy premium. That's a one-time fee, no subscription, and you have unlimited games forever. And the second revenue stream are map packs, content. So we have themed maps uh, based on cities, based on buildings like prisons for zombie apocalypse. We even have the shopping mall from Dawn of the Dead. Um, and real life countries, conflict situations. So I think at the moment we are around 25 maps, right? Almost 30, okay, very nice. And we have single player and cross platform multiplayer, which is sometimes a challenge because we have to update all platforms at once. So even if you have a TV OS version, you can play online in ranked and friendly games against Amazon players on the Kindle or iOS devices, Android devices, whatever. We started on Unity 5 and currently we are, actually that's a lie because yesterday we upgraded to 2018.4 uh, which will be for the next version. So, um, yes, because I'm from Austria, I'm also in charge at SMG for really bad and cheesy Schwarzenegger jokes. <laughs> like in that case, it would be get to the chopper. Um, we have, sometimes they force me to pronounce words like butterfly, which is Schmetterling or ambulance, which is Krankenwagen. <laughs> and they make fun of it, uh, of it, I can live with that. But that's an important part. We have to deal with a lot of dice rolls frustration on behalf of the customers. So, Risk, who has played Risk the board game? Hands up, okay, almost everyone. Who has played the mobile game? Okay, who played the mobile game and believes that the dice rolls are rigged in any way? You shut up, that's our QA guy, don't <laughs> trust him. <Yes. laughs> so uh, the problem is it's a competitive multiplayer game. Session lengths between one and two hours are actually quite often. People play for a global ranking for uh, in a Discord community of thousands of players where every single rank, I'm a Grandmaster level 202, uh, is really fought over. 
and a strategy that you have built up over 90 minutes can be destroyed in a single bad dice roll. And people go mad, they go crazy. We get uh, all kind of conspiration theories like, hey, if you purchase the premium version, you get better dice rolls, that's a classic. Or uh, the AI is rigged and always gets better dice rolls, otherwise it could never beat me. Yeah, sure, uh, we'll talk about the AI later. So we were confronted with rigging accusations. And even people who said, yeah, the game is all right, or really like the game, they started calling us out for rigging the dice rolls. And I can live with that. I mean, okay, one star rev is on the Google store. We know it's bad, it hurts your visibility, but you can reply, you can try to talk to the people. But sometimes they really go over the edge. And uh, last year we started getting death threats Oh. I've blackened out the actual person. Um, we contacted, of course, the authorities. The, it's from the United States, uh, Michigan area. And uh, the police actually told us, yeah, yeah, we know this guy, he's crazy, but currently he doesn't own weapons, so you should be fine. Uh, which is nice because I'm going to Indianapolis representing a risk in a few months. And I'm <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I meet him there. Uh, okay, we have an empty slide. And I have no idea what happened. Okay, so the problem of the user experience is they don't understand the specific rules. If you played Risk, like the board game, then you know, okay, every battle is broken down into three attackers versus two defenders. When you attack from a country with five troops, one is left behind, you have only four against the defenders. And a tight die is always won by the defender. That leads to dice odds that are not obvious. So when people have a country with like four of their own troops and they attack another country with three defenders, they think they are in advantage, they are not. Actually that's around, what, 37% chance to win? Yeah, something like that. Um, then people really struggle to cope with the consequences. As I said, they build up a strategy on maps with 50, 55 territories. They have slowly developed, they have beaten one, two enemies, they have outnumbered the opponent. Then they go for the killing blow and they lose. They attack with 60 troops against 25 and they lose and they lose the game and that's when they lose their shit, sorry. Um, and they have, they also have to, uh, they have difficulties with understanding randomness. You know, it's RNG based, random number generator, um, but the dice, no matter if it's a virtual simulated dice or a real dice, it doesn't have a memory. So if I roll a die and I have four times in a row rolled a six, the probability to roll another six is exactly the same like before, like rolling a one, two, three, four, or five. But people don't get it. People think, okay, when I lost two, three times in a row against the odds, or just slightly against the odds, I have to win the next one. No, it doesn't work like that. Um, so, and some of them, we investigated them, have so extreme streaks of bad luck that they are on the spectrum of a paranormal phenomenon. <laughs> no, it's, it's, we always thought they are crazy until we really looked into the data and you have people who lose against odds, um, who, lose, who lose battles where they have success chances with over 90% in 18 out of 20 cases no matter which RNG is involved. And then we started talking to them and it turned out they have this bad luck in all real life situations. And that's, <laughs> and that's where I have to say, okay, sorry, get a witch doctor, but we as developer cannot help you. So, but we can do something. So we developed that's By the way, uh, the record in roulette for a single series recorded 1943 in the Netherlands during the Second World War was seven times the double zero in a row. That's a probability of one to 110 billions. And it still happened. And we have in risk every day with splits, which is our, our automated speed up dice roll feature. 
we have 60 to 200 million dice rolls. Of course, some crazy results will happen. It's bound to happen that someone loses with one against 500,000 odds easily. Same on the right, the European lottery system has every week or at least every second week winners. And to win, you have to beat odds of one to 140 millions. Why, does, why do people still win? Yeah, because enough bets are done. Enough bets are placed. Uh, so it's bound to happen. And this is what we have done first. We have communicated the odds. We have explained the dice rules. Uh, we have put up papers, frequently asked questions. Uh, we have linked to battle calculators where people who said, hey, I lost with 10 against 10. That's outrageous. I lost three or four times with 10 against 10. It's outrageous. Then we link them to the battle calculators and they say, okay, yeah, it's not that unreasonable. Fine. We showed them the examples and then in the final step, we actually did everything on the development side of the game to make them happy. And that was by introducing a new game option, the balanced blitz, which will be explained by my colleague Aiken. Thank you, Johan. So today I'm going to walk you through the progress we made from the beginning of dice rolls to what we end up today with balanced blitz. Um, so I think that the approach we took was something that many developers would go the same route. We would just generate a random jumper between one and six for every dice roll thrown. And to do that, we used the inbuilt Unity random class. We didn't bother setting any seed because we didn't think we'd need it. Um, we thought everything would be fine, but <laughs> just imagine that there are ana analytics there. Um, <laughs> so we used our Google Analytics dice tracking results, and we saw an extreme. our extreme results came in higher than expected, at least based on the games played. It was hard to pinpoint the issue, so we had to kind of think of a different way to do the calculations. Every risk battle can be broken up into rounds, as Johan mentioned. Um, we have here in the table, red is the attackers and blue is the defenders. So there can be up to three attackers on the right or top and two defenders on the left. Uh, it's important to know that ties go in the favor of the defender. So you can see that reflected in the one versus one results where the attacker actually only wins a little over 40% of the time. Uh, using these hard-coded odds, we can then just generate one number from well, 0 to 1 as a float to fall into one of these categories. Um, yeah, that is just a different way of thinking of how to roll these dice. As a consequence of this, however, is that we, don't know we no longer have the dice tracking statistics because we're not actually rolling any dice anymore. We're just simulating it. So to get around this, we have to we have to keep simulating the dice until it matches the outcome that our one number prescribed. Whoop, that's double. We thought this would help, but nothing really changed. We s we s um, after thinking about it, we realized that the odds never really changed. We're just using the normal odds for every dice roll. Um, so we needed something new. The RNG that we used we, we knew that was the pillar or, or, or foundational pillar for our dice rolls. So we started to experiment. We started looking at different algorithms like XOR shift and Mercy and Twister. We tested them for their uniformity and distribution. And we found that the Mercy and Twister performed best for our use cases. So on the left, we have our results. We ran through many tests and we compared that to our control, which is the actual true results. And we can see a glimpse of like the deviations that we're observing. This is where the Mercy and Twister performed the best for us. <laughs> so something we wanted to address immediately was the existence of extreme outcomes. We're getting reports of like 20 versus 2 and losing is pretty crazy. So we, implement Im we implemented this as a kind of temporary hack until we could find the real solution. This was actually in the game at one point. So we just run through the rounds, round by round, in a normal blitz scenario. And at the end, as a post-game check, we would um, verify going through these rules. So with rule one, we can see that if the defenders started off with less than six, 
for less than or equal to six, and the attackers were this certain number, we would then force the attacker to actually win that battle, even if they lost. Um, we would just give out random heavy losses because they would have lost anyway. We know this This is pretty crazy, but they, uh, and we also had a, a net additional rule to account for higher numbers or greater than six as a factor. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, but actually uh, the colleague, unfortunately the former colleague who had the duty to implement this is today here. Thank you very much. Yes, so he was basically in charge for <laughs> doing this crazy step in between our other iterations and it survived much longer than we thought. <laughs> so this helped us see like a, a problem, like we couldn't, it helped us come up with a different perspective to see how we could solve this. Like initially we were just rolling dice for every, every or just generating a random dice roll. And then we looked at it from the perspective of a round and s had the odds there. So we wanted to zoom out even further and look at the entire battle as a whole. Um, so we have more tests coming through. Uh, we needed a way to generate odds based on the initial amount of attacking units and defending units. Uh, so we developed this tool which brute forces every possible permutation of a battle running down from the top all the way to the bottom. And we have the little, we developed a little unity editor tool to help us visualize these results. And we also made an in-game debug menu on the right here, which helped us simulate these battle results. And an important note here is that the simulator actually uses the in-game code, so we could know for sure what was happening. We could compare these to the two results on the right. Uh, another way to visualize this data, here we have a two versus two tree diagram. We can see on the bottom our four possible results from a two versus two. And we have the arrows indicating an outcome for a specific round. You notice that in the two versus two, we can possibly end the result right now with two losses to the attackers or two losses to the defenders, or we can just go straight to a one versus one. And we have the particular odds right there. Um, it's important to see here that the results of a one versus one is embedded in the possibility space of the two versus two. This will come into play later. Um, so let's think about how we can represent this data or encode it into a specific structure. Now taking a three versus three example, there are six possible outcomes that this could result in. So we're gonna represent that data in the remaining units for the winning side. So if the attacker wins, we'll they could either have three, two, or one remaining attackers at the end. Um, deriving from that data, we can add the total surviving or total winning chance for either side. So logically, if there are zero attackers remaining, then there must be at least one defender remaining. So you can see by looking at this, it kind of reveals a very familiar programming data structure. I'm sure many of you would notice. So obviously we can encode this data into a float array per side where the length of, well, the length equals the amount of units for that side plus one, that plus one to account for the zero surviving units. Um, accessing the data in this format is very convenient and intuitive. The index directly translates to the surviving units that you were trying to query. And then the overall win chance would just equal the zeroth index of the opposing sides array. So using this, it's now possible to determine to use a single number generated from the RNG to determine an entire risk battle. Um, another thing, I'm not gonna go too in depth here, but we didn't. this didn't really have a big impact, but we thought it was important to get right anyway, and that is the C generator for our um, RNG. So at the top we have just the default environment.tick count. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this. It's just a number that ticks up from when you start your device. We wanted to, we wanted this number to be as random as we could because it's obviously the, the basis of the RNG. It sets up the state and gives us good results. We just progress through, we're just generating a random number from int min to int max. Then we tried this GUID solution that we saw online, but ultimately we ended up using the RNG crypto service provider, which claims to have 
cryptographically secure data random generation. Um, you can see how that's used on the right. It's not too important right now. Um, so with balanced splits, it's important to understand our goals, what we're trying to achieve here, what we're trying to fix, solve. Um, we wanted the odds to be based off the true mathematical prob probability. Of obviously, we're going to adjust it here, but we wanted to base it off that so as to not defy the expectations of long-term risk players. We have some players that have been playing this game for years, and they're going to have an understanding of how dice rolls work, and they're going to have their own experiences to draw from, so we wanted it to be as true to that as possible. But we also wanted to eliminate the cases of extreme results. Um, this would give players more confidence, uh, leading to more strategic gameplay, we felt. And so to do that, we would adjust odds so that likely outcomes are more likely and more, uh, and unlikely outcomes are just less likely. Um, so to do this, we use the Unity, which is the inbuilt animation curve. This gave us the control and flexibility that we're going to need. So this may, let me just run you through here. We, we're going to need the max chance. This chances is the float array that I was talking about earlier, which contains the odds for uh, the outcomes for that for a battle. Um, we're going to use this max to then generate a proportion for every chance. I'm just going to iterate through. It's important to note that we're not taking the zeroth index because that's the overall chance. We're not modifying that yet. We're just doing the individual chances. And we're going to use that proportion of max to evaluate a position on the curve. This this value that spits out is going to be used as a multiplier to apply onto that original odd value. We can see, like for an example, if we have a, a chance value that's 5% of the max, and we set up the curve in such a way that that 5% evaluate, that evaluates to zero, as you can see far on the, on the left, um, if we pass in a 0 0.05, which is that 5%, it would evaluate to zero, and thus the effectively, the odd for that to happen is now zero. We have a similar approach for the overall win rate, but I won't go through that here. So this is kind of the fruits of our labor. You can, let me just explain this. You have a 10 versus 10 results here. Uh, the balanced blitz is in green and the true random is in orange, the original. You can see here that, well, it demonstrates this trimming effect that I was talking about earlier, where the less likely results get trimmed off and are now 0%, and the more likely results just get exaggerated, I guess. This is done in a way that's fair to both the attackers and defenders. Um, now, yeah, now we could actually remove those old rules uh, shown earlier, and we can provide the true random as an optional thing. So, yeah, that's where it is today. There's obvious improvements to come in the future, but we're pretty happy with where this ended up. Let me just hand it back to you, Han. Thank you very much. Um, yes, thanks, Aiken. Uh, I'm honest, it took me almost a year to understand everything behind the scenes of the dice rolls, and sometimes I'm still skeptical and think I have ghosts in my own machine when I lose one of my games, but that's okay. Um, what's more important is that these changes had a huge impact. We had like the complaints about risked dice r uh, rigged dice rolls, which were sometimes like two thirds of all complaints about the game. They went down by 80 to 90%. So we had like 10 to 20 a day complaining about the dice rolls and now it's one to two, sometimes even days without a single complaint about the dice rolls. And the people feel more empowered because if someone tells you, so I had this crazy experience and the next day I got the next crazy experience, then you ask, did you use balanced blitz? No, I didn't. Okay, try it. And then two days later they write back, okay, it's better now. Um, and the default is the balanced blitz and you see the impact on the gameplay. The game becomes more strategical and the people actually sometimes even write new uh, reviews or update their old reviews and claim that we have fixed it, which is BS. <laughs> we didn't fix anything. 
and the odds are still the same for premium and free AI, human, novice and expert player, but now people finally believe that, at least largely. So, the next big step was the AI. Let me sync that. I'll be back. Good, <laughs> not too bad. Uh, one of the challenges is that we have players who have been professional board game tournament risk players for over 40 years. And we have players who download the app and have their first game of risk in our tutorial. If they play the tutorial, no matter how much we highlight it and tell them, hey, if you never played risk, it's a really, really good idea to play the tutorial. No, they ignore it. And they write the customer support ticket five minutes later. So uh, what we need is an AI that can adapt first to very novice players so that someone who is really a beginner has a chance to win after three or four games his first game of risk. And also that is good and smart enough to beat an expert risk player who has like a ton of different strategies for all situations. And as we started to implement new game modes with new objectives, we also needed to adapt the AI for that. So let's look at the old feedback. So it was, again, after the dice rolls and the token system that limited the games per day, uh, the next number three of complaints was always the AI, with around 30% of the people claiming it's too hard. I set it too easy and it still wipes the floor with me. And around 70% of people complaining the AI is too easy. I've already ramped up to expert and I'm still winning every single game. I mean, often if you look into the back end, the claim of I win every single game is highly exaggerated. Uh, but in a nutshell, yes, they were right. So the point was to cater with the AI for a broader audience from super beginner to super expert in risk and to make it adaptive for our new game modes. And that's what Sandro did. Thanks, Johan. Uh, let's talk about AI. Uh, so after releasing the game, we quickly learned a few things. So the AI is very complex. And uh, there's even uh, an MIT associate that published a paper on this subject. There are many strategies, and it's really hard to know which one is better. Is it better to play aggressive? Is it better to play defensive? So we n having a flexible AI system was the key, and we didn't have that. Um, also, back to the problem that Johan mentioned, some people find it too easy, some people too hard. So what we can do to solve that and also, luck always plays a big role. So with that in mind, I promise this is the last Terminator GIF you'll see. <laughs> and I won't do an impression. Um, so we took a step back, and uh, we changed the entire structure of the AI. Having in mind, the flexibility is the most important thing. So to adapt to new game modes and rules. So we added the personas, we changed the way the objectives work, we improved on the scoring system that is used to make decisions, and we tweaked the how AI handles difficulty. I'm gonna get into each one of these in the next slide. So to start with, this is the basic structure of the AI. So in the center you have the, the base class with all those modules, claim, deploy, attack, and fortify. Those are the risk phases. And uh, there's also objectives, persona, and some other helpers. So with that, it's pretty easy to and pretty clean to just override the AI and just tweak one specific module without affecting others. Um, scoring system. So each one of those, each AI ha is composed out of those modules. Each one of those modules have many methods that help make the decision. So all the scores for each decision are added to a list, and we select the appropriate ones based on the difficulty. Um, okay, so here's one example of how the scoring system works for the attack phase. So at the top, you have like uh, where the attack should start from. So it goes through all the territories that the AI own. 
it calculates the score. I'm gonna get into details of that later. But pretty much, let's say, there are no enemies around that territory, so the score will be zero. Once you select the country to start with, we have to determine the country that it's going to attack. So it just loops through all the enemies. And last one, how many units you should move over. Um, and this is how we handle difficulty. So we want to make the AI the easy one to be, let's say, dumb, right? But not too dumb. So to not make any irrational uh, decisions. So as you can see there, there's the smart value. On expert is one, so it's gonna pick the best decision, always. Uh, on easy, 0 0.4, so it's around 40% of the best decision. And there is the obvious threshold there that we use that is just to, if there is a very obvious decision to make, just pick that one. So let's say all the scores are 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and then there is one that it's one. So we wanna make it rational even even though it's not always picking the best decision, but sometimes it has to. Uh, all right, so <laughs> this is the personas that we implemented. So on the left there, you have a list of all the personas, friendly, defensive, continental, aggressive. And at the top, the generic ones are in gray. Those are the attributes that we use. The blue ones are claimed. There's also for the attack, fortify, and the objective. So. For example, there's how risky the persona is. It does like eliminate player there. That's how much the AI should focus on eliminating a player in case they have the chance to do so. So just by tweaking these values, you get very different game experience just by doing that. Um, okay, this is the scoring, how the scoring works. So this is the attack target country. So it gets the score for the objectives. Uh, it gets continent ownership, eliminate player. All those methods that we have, they're all helper methods that return between zero and one. There's also battle success that we use a consistent to determine how likely are you to win the battle. So it does a quick check on the persona. That battle success threshold comes from the persona. So uh, it will ignore the attack if it doesn't meet that. And then in there at the bottom, there's score plus equals eliminated player times. So that stats dot eliminated player, that's the value in the persona. Just, just by swap changing those values, you get very different game experiences. And then we just normalize the score with the max possible and return always a value between zero and one. Uh, this is one example of how flexible it is. If we just, for the zombie AI on the zombie apocalypse game mode that we have, we wanted to make it very simple. So all you do, you override the method, and what we wanted is if zombies have twice as many troops as the enemy that they're trying to attack, just go for it. So it will add to the list of a score one. If they are all the same scores, it will just randomize and pick one. Uh, the objectives, so they use a very similar system as the structure as you've seen before. Uh, each objective is declared on that persona spreadsheet and they, and they, each persona deals with it differently. So the objectives currently we have are based on game modes. So we use, um, for example, zombie apocalypse is how much the AI should focus on zombies. So if you ever played that game mode, you know the the zombies are pretty weak, but they spread out really quickly. So it's the best option is to kill them at the start. So five round rumble, which is the game mode that has, uh, whoever has most territories after five rounds wins the game. So let's say you're the last player on the last round. You just wanna go all in because the game is gonna end after your turn. And also for the 70% domination is whoever reaches 70% of territory zone wins the game, which I'll go through here. Uh, so as you can see, it's a similar structure as the personas. Pretty much you will get the, the ratio of the leading player. So we have a min and max value there. So after f if someone is leading by 50% or more, then that's, that objective is gonna be active. And then it multiplies by the value on the spreadsheet. So if one persona does not care about a specific objective, 
to just set to zero. Um, so the battle simulation. Okay, we have all those values, but it's really hard to know how it will actually play out. You have a rough idea, but you don't know until you actually test. So we created a system that just put as many battles as you want to run, like the map, the settings, and you can have different personas on different difficulties. So we can test half of the players on expert, half the players on easy. You want the expert to win most of the times, right? So it is pretty easy and it's pretty fun to watch actually. So this is a very slow down version. Like it goes much quicker than that. But it's good to see sometimes a good comeback, like the yellow, it was almost dying and then it comes back. So it is pretty interesting. And, and here are the results that we use. So as you can see, uh, there's even the luck value. So we use a consistent for that. So determine how, how lucky the player was. So if you look like the sixth place was actually my debug persona. It lost, but it was pretty unlucky. So we take that into account. It is a, is a good way to know, broad to know how it actually performs. So where can we improve? Uh, now that we, we do have a system that it's pretty easy to add different strategies, uh, we're just gonna keep doing that. We know, cause we wanna give the user a different experience each time they play and they can't be very predictable. Uh, we want, the user to not know if it's playing against an AI or a real player. Also, we have an idea of doing swapping the personas in the middle of the game that we're working on, which is, let's say player one is always attacking player two. So then the AI on player two will just turn against player one. And uh, of course, difficulty is always something that we can improve. Um, okay. Thank you, Sandro. <laughs> A uh, surprise for you. No, I actually told you we, I had yesterday a meeting and it might be that we look into deep machine learning for the value optimization. <laughs> Have fun with okay. that. Uh, okay, just a quick wrap up of the AI work. Um, less complaints regarding AI. Most important, too easy versus too hard still happens, but it's like half-half balanced, which is a good sign and the AI can adapt to new game modes. And all of that, including all of our, all of that, including uh, content work, new features, fog of war, battle modes, community work, and of course, lots of new maps, has led us on a constant climb from last year to where we stand now. So we see the ratings going up, we see the installs going up, and we are actually many interesting years of risk still ahead for an app that was basically developed and published three years ago. Thank you very much. <laughs>